Hello, welcome to Liberty Baptist live stream. I am so glad you are joining us today. Using modern tools and technology, we can learn, worship, and praise Him. If this is your first time joining us, we would like to extend a very special welcome, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you for your presence. God has given Liberty Baptist a mission to proclaim His message to the world, that God loves you and provided His own Son to be your Savior, serving in Stockbridge, Georgia, and across the globe via technology. Please make sure to like and follow us on the social media platforms such as YouTube, Facebook, and of course our website at lbcstockbridge.org. And share this with your family and friends. Thank you again for joining us. We appreciate your support.
blessing. That right there was worth the price of admission, wasn't it? Who gets ner more nervous, the, the children or the parents, when they sing? Because you don't want to be embarrassed, but yet you want your kid to do well. And uh, that's awesome. I appreciate that. Good, good, good song, girls. Appreciate that very much. Open your Bible tonight, please, to 1 Peter chapter 2. Will be our, our, our text tonight, verse 9, uh, down to verse number 12. We'll be looking at uh, continuing the series we started a, a few weeks ago from the book of 1 Peter. And the series is called Faith on Trial. Faith on Trial, that's what the book of 1 Peter is all about. Uh, we go through times in our life where it, it is true, our faith gets tried and we have two choices, to fall or to stand. And uh, Peter gives us over and over and over again help, advice on how we can stand as our faith gets tried. Uh, we're going to look tonight at the, at the thought of, of, here's the title is, Now We're the People of God. Think about that. Of all the title you could give yourself, you're a person of God. Whether you're male, female, old, young, good-looking, ugly, uh, smart, not so smart, and we'll stop there. You, as a believer, you are a person of God. You're a child of God, and uh, what a wonderful thought that is. And because that is true, there are some things that are true in your life. And we're going to see tonight five things that are true because of we are a child of God. Look, please, in 1 Peter chapter 2. And we'll ask you to stand your feet as you read uh, three verses or four verses tonight in 1 Peter chapter 2. Look in verse number 9. <clears throat> I want to remind you that we're in the world, but the world doesn't have to be in us. And we, are, and we are pilgrims in this world, but we don't need to be partakers of the world. And we're in the world, but we don't have to be like the world. And Peter's going to emphasize that again tonight. And he starts off right here in verse number 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Let's stop there just for a moment. Just take a quick time out. Remember, God's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What a blessing that is. Don't you love this, the truth of the Bible? We don't got to make up any stories. We don't got to make the Bible say something that the Bible does not say. We can just say it like it is. God's called you as a believer out of darkness and into his marvelous light. What a blessing. Verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which hath not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims as abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. I want to preach on that thought tonight. We are now the people of God. Right from verse 10, we are now the people of God. Let's pray together, please. Lord, we thank you that your word is true. And we thank you, God, that it tells us how to live. You tell us in your Bible how we can live. And you describe to us the life that pleases Jesus Christ, and that's the life that's set apart for God for use in his service. And I pray tonight, God, that we might be challenged once again from this great uh, passage about, about now we are your people. We belong to you, you belong to us, and we thank you for that. But help us as we leave here in a little bit to be able to say it was good to be in your house on a Sunday night. Father, bless your word. Bless the truths of your word. May your Holy Spirit do a work in our heart that only he can do, and that's to touch our heart and change our life. We'll be careful to give you praise and honor and glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat, please. Thank you so much for standing for all of that. Well, I just said this quote, but I'm going to quote it again. Just because we are pilgrims in this world does not mean we have to be partakers of the world. And what that means is this, have you, have you noticed it's about your lot in life, whatever it is? You're living in an e evil world. You're living in a world that hates the things of God. You're living in a world who despises the church. You're living in a world that hates the Bible. You're living in a world that, that, uh, de that, that destroys the things of God. You're living in a world that cannot stand Jesus Christ. And if we're not careful, some of that will rub off. On us, you know the truth of the matter. You've heard it said, a a uh, a bad apple spoils the whole bunch, and and many of us, not so much 
the staff here, but many of, of us work in a, in a place where you might be the only good apple in the whole bunch. You might be, uh, you might be uh, the only believer in your entire place where you work. You may be the only believer in your family. You may be the only believer in your class. You may be the only believer that's, that, that is in your area. And tonight, God would have us to be reminded that you and I are a special person because we're a, we're a child of God. As a matter of fact, we ha there's five things that are true about us because we're people of God. And I hope this will be a help to you, first of all. We notice in verse 9, notice our position. Notice our position. And then Peter goes on to mention several things about our position. In verse 9 he says this, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. By the way, we're not righteous because we do righteous stuff. We're righteous because of Jesus Christ. We cannot earn righteousness. We cannot do anything to make ourselves more righteous. There's no behavior we can do. There's no ritual we can partake in. Our position as righteous is only because of Jesus. And in our position, we notice that we are privileged. You realize you're privileged tonight? You're privileged. You're a chosen generation. God chose you. God could have chosen anything, any uh, person, any, uh, any thing in this world to represent Him, and yet God chose you. You are a privileged person. Uh, your position is you're privileged. It's amazing to think that when you are adopted into the family of God, you have all the privileges as a believer. You have all the privileges as a son or daughter of God. You have access to certain power because God is your Father. You have access to certain rights because you're a child of God. Think about that. Certain things are true about you and about me just because we're a child of God. We're privileged. Now, if you were to come into my house, I don't think you'd go looking in our cabinets and pulling out our drawers and seeing what we got in our drawers, and I don't think you'd be looking in our closet and looking up under our bed and seeing what we got. No, you can't do that in my house. But I can do that in my house. I can go in any room. I can go in any closet. I can go in any drawer at my house. And I can do that because that house, that's my house. And, and I have certain rights in my house, and you have certain rights at your house. I would never go to your house and look under your bed or look in your closet. How dare me do something like that? I don't belong there. I don't have a right to do that. But as a believer, as a child of God, we have all the rights given to us by God himself. Look at verse 9. We are a chosen generation. We're privileged. We have access to everything that God is. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Galatians 4.7 says it like this, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Church, we are privileged. Second of all, we are a priesthood. <laughs> what kind of priesthood are we? We're royal priesthood. What that means is this, we can go directly to God. We don't have to make an appointment to see the priest because we are a priest. We don't have to go into a confessional box. We don't have to make an appointment with our God. We can go straight to Him. No need to go through the secretary. Amen. Hebrews 4, 16, I, I think I read this verse this morning. I'm not sure, but I, I'm going to read it again. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Listen, church, God is always available to His children. And there's times in our life, me as a father, I may be too busy. I may have some things going on. I may not be able to stop what I'm doing right now and talk to my children. But God is never too busy for you. He's never too busy to me. We have direct access to the God of heaven to help in our time of need. And when you call upon God, uh, His office is always open. Amen. You never get a voicemail. <laughs> is voicemail still a thing? A little bit, I guess. <clears throat> You don't have to send a text or an email. Listen carefully. You can send a P-mail. That's prayer, by the way. 
Never a busy signal. There's always service. <laughs> Don't you just hate cell phones and why you love them at the same time? Always get into a bad spot. I mean, not that you talk when you're, on the, when you're, when you're driving because you never do that. Let's just say, for instance, if you're driving and you're on the phone, you go to the bottom of the hill, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, I'm in a bad spot. Uh, but with God, there's never a bad spot. There's always service to the King of glory. Isaiah 65, 24 says, And it shall come to pass, listen please carefully, that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. 1 John 5, 14, 15 says this, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Church, you're privileged. You're a priesthood. Number three, we are purified. Purified. Look at the next phrase, a holy nation. Like it or not, we are to be a holy people. We're to be holy. Why? Because He's holy. And because we belong to Jesus Christ, we must represent His holiness. And unfortunately, many people get their idea of God as they see us. You, you've heard it said, you, you may be the only Jesus anybody ever sees. And oh, don't we often let God down? Don't we often make him look bad? When was the last time you went to a restaurant and you got bad service? The, the, wait, the, the waitress or the waiter, they didn't bring your food out quick enough. Or they didn't keep your water filled up. Or that you asked for extra napkins, they didn't give you extra napkins. <laughs> Or you asked for a spoon, they didn't give you a spoon. Every time you got your spoon, your corn was cold. You got to use your fork. Or they didn't top off your whatever. They didn't bring you your whatever. And, and it took them a while to get your food. And, and, and you think to yourself, well, I'm never going to come back here again, bless God. Listen, it's not that waitress or that waiter's fault. But we get our opinion about a restaurant because of the kind of service we get. It could just be a bad day. You realize waiters and waiters sometimes have bad days? The cook could be, I don't know, uh, going through something, and I'm the world's worst at complaining about service at a restaurant, but I'll tell you this, we ought, to never, we ought to never judge an entire restaurant by the service we get from one, uh, one trip there. But you know what some people do? They judge God by what they see in us. Well, I'll never go to that church if that's how they act. If that's how they talk down at that church, I'm not going to go there. If that's how they respond when things don't go right, well, I want no part of that. Can I remind you, as I remind myself tonight, listen, you and I, we're to be a holy nation. We're to be holy because God is holy, and that ought to challenge you and I to do all that we can to represent our Father to the best of our ability, wait for it, and even better than our ability. <clears throat> we cannot be sinless, but we can sin less. We can't be sinless, but we can be blameless. Talking about having a good testimony. We are privileged. We're a priesthood. We're purified. Number four, we are peculiar. Somebody say amen right there. A peculiar people. That doesn't mean we're weird, but sometimes we are. It means we have the characteristic of belonging to somebody. Your life ought to show forth, the Bible tells us, the praises of Him. Our testimony, our, our reputation, if you will. Folks, when they look at us and see us, they ought to say, you know, there's something different about that dude or that girl. There's something different about them. They don't act like I act. They don't talk like I talk. Their attitude's better. They're always happy. They, they, yeah, they're going through a tough time, the corona crisis. I mean, it's got them all uh, befuddled, but they, they have a smile on their face. They have, a, they, have a, they have a jump in their step. They're happy. It's almost like they love something outside of themselves. They're a peculiar people. What's it mean to be peculiar? It means that when somebody looks at you or something, there's no doubt who that thing belongs to. If you were to walk out into the parking lot later and you were to see a white pickup truck, and on that pickup truck 
was a bunch of orange teas all over it. Don't laugh yet, I ain't done. And the license plate would say something like, Go Vols. And when the horn went off, it played Rocky Top. That truck would be peculiar to somebody in here, either me or Roger, and probably me. <laughs> so they look at the truck and say, that truck, that, the preacher got a new truck. Look at it. That's the preacher's truck. Someone looks at you and say, you know, that, 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 that person belongs to God. They act like God acts. They act like Jesus acts. They are a peculiar people. Our position is this. We're privileged. We are a priesthood. We're purified. And we are peculiar. And they may say peculiar and mean it in a bad way, but let's make peculiar be a good way. Let it talk, make us talk about Jesus Christ. We ought to know that we belong to Him, and we ought to be proud of it. I guarantee you, if I had a white truck with orange tees all over it that played Rocky Top when I pressed on the horn, I'd be proud of, of, of that truck. <laughs> Amen. In other words, we ought to act in such a way that there's no doubt who we belong to. Our position. And let's, let's hurry, listen quicker. Notice also our purpose in verse 9. That ye, who's the ye, the believer, the chosen generation, the royal priesthood, all that, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The reason that we're to live for God is not for our praise, but it's for his praise. We don't want to lift up ourselves. We want to lift up Jesus Christ. Listen, church, can I remind you, it's not about us. It's all about Him. It's not about our agenda. It's about His agenda. Our life is to be lived for His purpose so we can glorify Him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or, or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Even when your faith is being tried, you still have a purpose. What is that purpose? First of all, it's to magnify the divine. Our purpose is to magnify the divine. The phrase says that ye should show the praises of Him. Our life ought to do one thing and one thing only. Our life should lift up Jesus Christ. The Bible says this, that if we lift up Jesus Christ, what's He going to do? He's going to draw all men to Himself. And so often, and I'm probably the world's worst at this, but so often we want to, uh, we want to show forth our own agenda and we want to lift up our own ideas and our own thoughts and our own doctrines. But the Bible tells us right here, as a person of God, we are to magnify the divine. We live our life in such a way that it makes Jesus look really, really good. We magnify the divine. And secondly, we make a difference. I love this part of verse 9 who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. What a blessing. We're to make a difference. Somebody said this, and I hope you'll listen carefully. God didn't save us to impress the world. He saved us to impact the world. God didn't save us to impress the world, but He saved us to impact the world. Think about the early church in the book of Acts. Those disciples, they weren't very impressive. Remember what somebody said about them? says they're just a bunch of unlearned and ignorant men. But yet this group of unlearned and ignorant men, what they do? They turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. And the church grew like crazy and folks were getting saved like crazy because it wasn't about those disciples. It wasn't about those churches. It wasn't about their sermons. It was all about their Savior. And they lifted up Christ and Christ blessed and Christ multiplied the church and the church grew and folks got saved and the difference was so vast and it was so awesome that it's still taking effect 2,000 years later today in the year 2020. <clears throat> So why don't we just follow their example? 
and do what we can do to make a difference in this dark world in which we're living in. You've heard it said, and I'll say it again, our world is dark, but the darker the night, the brighter the light. And a little research, just looking at some things, and, and uh, I hope this is true. I, I don't know if it is, so I can't guarantee you this, but it sure makes a good story. <laughs> Scientists say that the average star is bigger than, is the size of a football field. Now, the average star, a football field is 120 yards wide by about 60, uh, long by about 60 yards wide. I don't know how many square feet it is, but it's a pretty good size of a football field. And the average star is about the size of a football field. And they also say the average star is anywhere between 200,000 and 250,000 miles away. And so you can see from right here on earth tonight, if it's not cloudy or whatever, you can look out and you can see a star the size of a football field 250,000 miles away. That's pretty good vision, or is it the fact that the star is pretty bright? That you can see a star that's a quarter of a million miles away. It's amazing the difference a little light can make. We went to Mammoth Cave several years ago, and, and uh, part of the tour, we, we went down about a, a quarter mile deep into the earth, and, and if you've been there, you, you realize it was so dark. You ever been such, and it's so dark, you could feel the darkness? I mean, you could like, like, it's dark in here, man. And it's cold and all of that. And, and, so, and so the guy says, okay. He says, turn off your cell phones, turn off all your lights, and we're going to see just how dark it is. And we turn everything off. I mean, it was dark. It was pitch black dark. It was so dark. You could feel it. It was so dark. You could almost taste the darkness. And then somebody's cell phone went off. And not only did you want to go and smack them upside the head, but you're like, dude, he said turn your phones off. But it's amazing. This entire uh, uh, cave, if you've ever been there, you know how big it is, was dark, pitch black, dark, so dark you could feel it, so dark you could taste it. And this one little cell phone lit up the entire cave. Why is that? Because what a difference a little bit of light makes. What did Jesus say? Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Ye are the light of the world. A city that set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We can make a difference in this world. By the way, that's our purpose, to magnify the divine and make a difference. Number three, notice in verse 10, we notice our past. Our past. Look in verse 10. Which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. One of the great motivators in my present life is my past life. Now, I wasn't one of those what you'd call terrible sinners. You know, I wasn't saved out of drugs, and I've, I've got no illegitimate children anywhere, or none of that kind of stuff. And I, the only time I've been in jail was to visit my brother, so I know nothing about all of that. So I can't get up here and tell you that, you know, God delivered me from drugs and from uh, dope and from marijuana and from beer. And no, I don't have that testimony, but I do have this testimony. I was lost and headed to hell. <clears throat> I wasn't a terrible sinner, but I was a sinner. I mean, I made good grades. I got a scholarship to college to play baseball. Never got in trouble. But I was lost. My life was headed in the wrong direction because my life was all about me, myself, and I. And if I would have died before September 29th, 1991, I would have gone straight to a devil's hell. But guess what happened to me? I heard the story about Jesus Christ. And I was gloriously saved. Now think about my past. I think about what God has saved me from. It motivates me to do all that I can for Jesus in my present. Now for a moment, think about what God saved you from. I don't know all of your stories. I don't know all of your past life lifestyles. I don't know what's 
in your closet, so to speak. I don't know what God has delivered you from, but I do know this. He saved you from hell, and you get to go to heaven all because of Him. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you hath He quickened. That means He's given you life who were dead in your trespasses and sin. In verse 10, Peter reminds us of our past. Look, listen, write this down. Look at number 1. We were a stranger, but now we're a saint. We were a stranger, but now we're a saint. We've been changed by God. There's been a spiritual metamorphosis that's taken place. There has literally been a change in our life and a change in our lifestyle. God didn't simply remodel us. God tore down the old house and built a brand new house. You've seen those... Uh, home flipper shows, haven't you? Flipper flop and all those things. God is not in the people flipping business. No, He don't just move a wall here and make a door there. He just don't paint over some wallpaper. He just don't put some new plumbing in. No, listen, church, here's what He does. He tears down the old house and builds a brand new house. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You haven't been flipped. You've been forgiven. That'll preach, won't it? <laughs> you have a new destination, a new lifestyle. You were once a stranger, but now you're a saint. Number two, we once were under judgment, but now we're justified. We once were under judgment, but now we're justified. Verse 10, the last part of the verse says, which hath not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You know the word justified means that when God sees us, it's just as if we've never sinned. Our sins, praise be unto God, are in the past. The Bible tells us that He takes our sin and He casts them as far as the east is from the west. And what else does the verse say? To be remembered no more. Now the devil wants you to remember your sin, and you remember your sin, but God doesn't. We once were under judgment, but now we've been justified. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Oh, listen, we all have things in our past that we wish weren't there. We all have a reason not to run for Congress and not to try to be on the Supreme Court, don't we? And if uh, there is nothing, they'll look for something, won't they? They'll find it, believe it or not. They'll make it up, but it's there. We all have things in our past that we're not very proud of. But you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, you know what, Matt? I took those things from you. Remember, you gave me those things. Why do you keep digging them up? Why do you keep thinking about them? Why do you keep letting them uh, hurt your present? Why do you keep dwelling on the past, press on towards the future? We once were under judgment, but now we've been justified. When Jesus looks at me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees the blood of his own son. <clears throat> our position, our purpose, our uh, past, number four, notice our, our, our pilgrimage. Dearly beloved, Peter says in verse 11, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Not only are you a peculiar, but you're also strange. <laughs> the word pilgrimage, it, it means this. It's a journey of varied lengths to a destination usually designed to pay homage to another. You know that song, This World Is Not My Home, I'm just a passing through. You know that song. But we often forget while we dwell on the things of this present world, we often forget, listen church, this world is not our home. We're just a passing through. We're strangers. We're pilgrims. Uh, our home is not down here. Our home is up there. Our journey down here is a short journey. In other words, we're on a, a pilgrimage. And on this pilgrimage, uh, Peter gives us a compassionate reminder. Look in verse 11. He says this, Dearly, Beloved, <laughs> he reminds us that whatever is going on, we're loved by God. We might often get to the point where we question 
one another's motives, we ought to say, why in the world did he do that? Or why did she do that? That was crazy. But we ought to never question God's motive. It's a, it's a compassionate reminder. We are the beloved of God. And when God does something, or when God allows something, or when God commands us to do something, He does so because He loves us. And when our faith is on trial, remember, church, uh, He loves you no matter what. It's a compassionate reminder. Number two, there's a clear rebuke. I beseech you. Look what he says. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts. We've been reminded of this quite a few times the last couple of weeks. But this spiritual journey we're on, man, it's a warfare. And it's not, it's not against flesh and blood. The Bible tells us that. Our warfare, it's a spiritual warfare. And we don't fight this spiritual battle with carnal equipment. We don't use pistols and shotguns and oozes and all that. No, we, we fight spiritual battles with spiritual weapons. Uh, we fight it with our Bible. We fight it with the Holy Spirit. We fight it with our faith. Billy Sunday said this, If you want to stop sinning, uh, then stay out of the devil's neighborhood. We often think that we can defeat the devil by sneaking up on him. Yeah, right. Try that. Go ahead. Now in... Uh, in physical warfare, I, I'm assuming it's good to sneak up on the enemy, catch him off guard. But church, can I tell you, you're never going to catch the devil off guard. Remember what he says? He's walking about, seeking who may devour. He's not at home taking a nap. He's not on, uh, he's not on uh, R&R. &R. He's not uh, taking... He's, no, he wants to destroy you and to devour you, and you are no match for the devil, so stay away from him. Stay out of his neighborhood. John Getz said this, he said, there's, a, there's way too much window shopping at the mall of sin. You may never intend to buy anything, but I'll guarantee that the devil will always have some free samples. Ephesians 5.11 says this, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. As we are on this journey, we must abstain from fleshly lust. There's a compassionate reminder. There's a clear rebuke. Number three, there's a conversation respected. Look in verse 12. Having your conversation, which means lifestyle, by the way, don't forget that, means lifestyle. Ha have it honest among the Gentiles. Uh, again, we're talking about hypocrisy. We're talking about we are to talk the talk and walk the walk. We're talking about what comes out of our mouth ought to also come out of our lifestyle. It means that we're to be the same person Sunday through Saturday. There's to be a conversation or a lifestyle that's to be respected. <clears throat> Number four, there's a common resistance. In verse 12, conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall see, oh, shall be, uh, behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Anybody ever talk bad about you? Don't raise your hand because they're all going to go up if I do. Anybody ever talk bad about you? Well, was it the truth? Again, don't raise your hand. Or were they just lying on you? You know what the devil does? The devil will lie on you all the time. The world will try to make up stuff. You remember the story of Daniel? They thought they could get Daniel in trouble. So his buddies, they, his buddies, they looked around his closet and under his bed, looked on his phone, looked at his computer, and they could find Daniel doing nothing wrong. So they, they, they think to themselves, well, how are we going to get rid of Daniel? He's, he's the favorite. He never gets in trouble. He's goody two-shoes. He's holier than thou. How are we going to get rid of that dude? I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go to the king. The, 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 the Bible tells us they go to the king and they say, Oh, king, live forever. In other words, oh, king, you're the bomb. King, you're great. And king, you know what you ought to do, king, because you're king? You ought to make this rule, see? And this rule ought to be something like this. Um, 
You want to make this rule that says, if anybody in the entire country, if they pray to anybody except for you, O king, because remember, O king, live forever. You're the bomb. If anybody prays to anybody besides you, then king, here's what you ought to do. You ought to put them in the lion's den. Yeah, that's what you ought to do. And the king says, yeah, that's what I ought to do. That way I'll get some allegiance. Nobody can pray to anybody but me. So he makes this rule, and he signs it with his signet ring, and he puts his approval there. He says, okay, here's the rule. Anybody who prays to anybody besides me, they're going to the lion's den. And the very first uh, person to be guilty of this rule was Daniel. They looked on his phone. They looked on his computers. They looked at his Google searches. They looked at all of his emails. And they say, man, we got to find something on him. And they couldn't. All they could find was Daniel doing things that were good. I mean, he was praying. He was living for God. He was doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And they couldn't find anything against him. All they could find was something that was godly, something that was completely legal and moral and right, and now they make the right, they make it illegal, and they say, okay, king, you got to keep your word. You put your ring on there. It was rule. It's policy. It's been, it's been signed. It's been, it's been written down on paper. It is the rule. It's your executive order, king. So you got to put Daniel in the lion's den now when they did, and don't you just know what they, Daniel survived. You know the story. Here's the point. The world will try to blame you for stuff. The world will try to mess up your testimony. The world will try to destroy your life. The world will try to defeat you. But here's what Peter's saying. You know what? You're different now. That stuff can't bother you now. It can't affect you now. Because you're privileged, you're priest, you're purified, you're peculiar, you're just on a pilgrimage. It's not going to last that long anyways. Number five, and we're going to be done here in just a moment. We notice our passion. Our passion. Look at the rest of verse 12. <clears throat> Whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. We need to keep ourselves encouraged in the Lord. And we can't let the trials of life steal our passion. We do so by, first of all, keeping a clean light. Look what the verse says. It's right from the Bible. Uh, they may by your good works. They're going to see your good works. You're to have a clean light. Again, Peter says, be light. Be a clean light. Thankfully, as a believer, we're not the source of our light. We're just the light bulb. We've got to make sure that we're screwed into the right light source, and that's Jesus Christ. We don't have to produce the light. We just have to be the light. <clears throat> a clean life and finally, a clean light and finally a changed life. A changed life. Glorify God in the days of visitation. Thank the Lord we've been changed. We're not what we're going to be. And thank God we're not what we used to be. But we're what we are. What are we? We're a child of God. And our life's been changed. Let me share a story with you and we're going to be done. The man named George... Mensick. You may have heard of George Mensick in the early 1900s. He was on Al Capone's gang. There's a story written about Mr. Mensick, and the story is given this title, A Gangster for Christ. And this man, Mr. Mensick, he lived an awful life of drugs and alcohol and crime and everything else you can think of. On several occasions, he drove Al Capone's getaway car. His wife heard Billy Sunday preaching and got saved. And she prayed constantly for her husband to get saved as well. And the story tells us one night as George got home, he intended to kill his wife and his four-year-old girl. He stormed into the house very drunk and belligerent. His wife tried to stop him. He beat her with a pistol until she was unconscious. 
Thinking she was dead, he went upstairs to shoot his little girl while she slept. And he burst the bedroom door open. His little girl wasn't sleeping. She was praying. And he overheard his daughter praying these words, Lord Jesus, please save my daddy. Lord Jesus, please save my daddy. He fell to his knees immediately and trusted Christ as his very own Savior. God changed his life and called him to be a preacher. He was an evangelist that traveled around the world preaching in prisons and won many inmates to the Christ. He went on to be an evangelist for the very famous Pacific Garden Mission and became the very first missionary appointed by Baptist World Mission. By the way, we still support missionaries from Baptist World Mission. God changed his life, and God made him a clean light. Can I challenge us tonight to not let the trying of our faith destroy our passion for God? We are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So can I ask you tonight, how's your life going? How's your life going? Let's bow, please, and bow for prayer. Every head bow, every eye closed, please, for just a moment. As the musicians make their way forward, we're going to play a song in just a moment. I want to ask you this. Is your faith being tried tonight? And has the trying of your faith, has it affected your walk with God? Has it destroyed your passion for the things of God? Has it affected you in such a way that you don't even consider the things of God anymore? You, you say, preacher, I'm here. Yes, I'm glad you're here, but pay attention, please. Are you really here? Maybe you need to find a place down here at the altar and say something like this, Lord Jesus, help me tonight. Help me not lose my passion for God. Help me to make a difference in my life. Help me to, to be a light at work, a light at school. Help me to make a difference in the world in which I'm living in. Maybe you're struggling and you just need God to give you some strength. And then I wonder tonight, might there be somebody here that does not know Christ as their personal Savior? Tonight's the perfect night for you to call upon the Lord to be saved. But whatever it is, in a moment as we play, as we pray in a moment... Uh, I, I wonder, did God speak to you? Maybe you need to come to the altar and make a decision for the Lord. How's your passion for God tonight? How's your passion? Are you making a difference? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. And God, might your word speak to us tonight. May your Holy Spirit do a work in our hearts and lives. God, help us as our faith is being tried to not give up on God and not lose our passion. The world has a way of discouraging us. We understand that. The world has a way of depressing us. We understand that. But God, help us to stay on fire for the Lord.